Thanks very much to Ed Calabresi for inviting me, certainly for Denise Leonard for all of her support, and to all of you for having me participate in this. I've been working with the preconditioning group and with another group Ed and I are working with, which is the Neural Protection Optimization Enhancement Group for a number of years. And I think that the field really is coming of age. I think that there are a number of reasons for that, not least of which is the field participates with the type of heuristic vigor that so many other areas of science, but particularly the brain sciences are brought, which is that we have particular tools that are at our disposal, and I'll discuss some of these tools. And those tools, inclusive of tools of knowledge and understanding, provide us with a general theoretical concept of what's going on. They allow us to create theoretical constructs and conceptualize that in operationalizable ways, whether it's in medicine for therapeutic benefit or beyond the bedside, if you will, into those areas of the public domain where we're looking to optimize and in some cases enhance individuals' performance, whether it's athletically, militarily, or just in their daily lives. But then we get to the limits of things we understand, and very often that's exactly what we found with hormetic responses. How were these things possibly occurring? What were their actual mechanisms? To do this, we needed new tools, and in fact, many new tools are being developed, some specifically towards these purposes and ends, and others towards a larger agenda that can then be harnessed to these silos of application. Before I go any further, I just want to make sure you note, as, as was said in my introduction very kindly, I do work with DARPA and I do work with the Pentagon. Nothing that I'm saying to you here necessarily reflects those opinions or those of the Department of Defense or federal government, although in some cases, as you probably are well aware, there is a real interest in these types of responses and how we can engage them for obvious benefit, not only to military medicine, but also for performance optimization and enablement. I think one of the things I'd like to do first and foremost is frame the issue for you, and the issue as we'd like to frame it is in this context. Now, I come to you as a brain scientist with almost 39 years at the bench and at the bedside. And one of the things we're very interested in, as you'll hear throughout these next two days, is how both peripheral and central mechanisms can potentiate the function, structure, durability, and optimized performance of the nervous system, whether that's in neural function with regard to motoric capacity, as you'll hear somewhat later this afternoon and tomorrow, whether here it's recovery from a variety of different insults and injuries, or whether it's an optimizing neurological and physiological basis, which then can enthuse cognition, emotion, and behavior. So we consider this to be the NPO range. In other words, neurological protection, optimization, and enhancement. And these terms are, in fact, interactive, but in some cases are mutually exclusive. The goals are, as we see here, pretty much what we recognize is the, the notion the aim, the target, and it's something of a moving target based upon what we know about nervous systems and the way they're structured and the way they operate. So obviously this is an iterative corpus of information, is to in some way engage, access, and affect endogenous neurophysiological processes in a bottom-up and or top-down way so as to do these three things, protect, optimize, and in some cases move towards excessive optimization, which we then consider to be enhancement. So we're looking to sustain and or maximize structural and functional integrity vis-a-vis -vis the domain of performance and obviously protection. We're looking to perform specific defined outputs, and this is very important, and I'll talk to you about that in a moment. I think that the idea of matching task and tract, if you will, becomes much more specific when developing not only theoretical constructs of how these things may happen, but what tools we may have in our toolkit to be able to ensure that they do. And last, supersession of particular limits. And this is where we really begin to push the boundaries of what we thought the system could perform so as to go beyond those limits of performance. And this is what we now consider to be maximized enablement or enhancement. So what we're looking to do is to utilize the very things that each and all of you are working on to some extent, induction and alteration of inherent processes through internal and external ecological modifications, internal environmental modifications, that is to say bodily processes that we know operate within a range of physiological parameters, and or the induction or modification of those parameters through external means. These could be things like altering the oxygen saturation level of the ambient environment and or changing levels of exogenous stress, what we like to call challenges rather than stressors, that then produce a reactive and adaptive shift in a host of, of physiological processes that create either a leftward or a rightward change in performance and or physiological functional curves. However, we can also utilize a host of exogenous tools. And it's these exogenous tools that appear to be increasing in their capability of what we can assess and what we can affect. And I want you to remember those two terms particularly with an intermediate term in between. If we look to these new toolkits in ways of being able to look more deeply into what the structure and functional capacities of these systems entail and obtain, 
then we have two challenges that may also be potentiated by these new technologies and these new techniques. The first is that we may be able to have more selective access to these systems and substrates, and by so doing, we can target them. We can affect them with higher specificity, greater granularity. This is the area in which I work. I work in an area called neuroscience and technology, which is sometimes referred to colloquially as neuro s and and I'll continue to use that contraction throughout this particular lecture so as to be able to give you some working shorthand. In brief, we can parse neuroscience and technology into two general domains of categorical use, the assessment approaches and the interventional approaches. The assessment approaches are, as we have listed here, and there are a variety of them, which include things like biomarkers, genetic, genomic, and proteomics, and a host of different forms of imaging that I'll detail for you in a moment. As well, we can utilize these things in a conjoined way that I will describe for you subsequently in today's lecture. And this is a real opportunistic window, I believe, to sort of de-silo some of the usual constraints that have provided limitations on the way we use certain tools and techniques so as to open up the opportunity space to allow a much more co-registered, conjoined use of these different tools so as to be able to present both a more globalized picture of what may be going on bottom up and top down and also a much more granular picture at those levels of specificity with those substrates upon which we're looking to choose, select, and engage. But of course, do I want you to think about this as in quasi-military terms. It's not just enough to do the reconnaissance mission to say what's going on. Those things that we then find that are viable and valuable may also serve to be targets for our intervention on a variety of different modes from the most benign, in other words, the older tricks, if you will. The idea here is those older tricks that we've talked about in the past include such things as oxygen restriction, various forms of hypoxic environments, intermittent induced fast, various metabolic shifts, types of behaviors, engagements, physiological stressors with regard to levels of activity versus inactivity. These are all older tricks, lower tech tricks that are available in our current toolkit. The question then is, how do we utilize these older tricks and in fact teach them new tricks? How do we use the new tools, if you will, to modify old tricks and make them new? Well, we can do this two ways. The general paradigm is quite simple. Number one, we need to assess what's going on. What do those older tricks really do? Not only in terms of the mechanisms, but also in terms of the spatiotemporal dimensions that they occupy. In other words, where are the substrates? What are the nodes and networks that are being engaged? And what is the temporal sequence of this may be very, very important. So as you'll hear throughout today's and tomorrow's lectures, it may not simply be a question of A, B, and C substrates interacting, but what is the temporal sequence? What is the necessary time relationships that must occur between the A-ness, the B-ness, and the C-ness? And it may also be that there are mechanisms that are involved interstitially, if you will, between A, B, C, all the way to Z, that then also become viable targets once identified and if accessible. And then certainly our access and affecting toolkit allows us to then be able to have engaged access and viability to utilize these tools at our disposal in such a way that we can then maximize the effect. If we move from the assessment to the interventional realm, we then see a host of neuroscientific tools and techniques that are currently available at our disposal. Certainly, these include pharmacology inclusive of nanopharmacology, which really represents the viable range of hormetic responses, peripheral to central forms of stimulation, including but not limited to such things as vagal nerve stimulation, various forms of neurofeedback harnessed to other approaches, some behavioral, some cognitive, some physiological, a whole range of transcranial modulatory techniques. And in fact, just a year ago, Dr. Calabrese and I hosted a conference right here at Amherst that looked at various forms of transcranial electrical and magnetic stimulation to be able to potentiate these forms of protective optimization and enhancement responses in brain and in the periphery various forms of neuroprosthesis, inclusive of brain-machine interfacing, and deep brain stimulation. And in fact, we're learning quite a bit from deep brain stimulation because we're finding out what the node-edge relationships are between identified neural targets in the brain and the top-down mechanisms that they may mediate or subserve. So in sum, what I want you to remember with regard to this newer toolkit is that we have at our disposal the capability to realistically engage what I call the five A's. Those five A's are, as you see here before you on the screen, the actual ability, and that's, that's very important, the actual ability to assess, access, and affect 
definable substrates in the central and peripheral nervous system so as to be able to provide a more accurate, more finely grained understanding of what these potential hormetic and pre and post conditioning mechanisms entail and obtain. And through that, be able to then harness our interventional toolkit in ways that many types of situations can synergize our existing tools, these older tricks, and perhaps potentiate them so as to engage both the leftward shift in their temporality and an increase in their amplitude and rightward shift of effect. I really believe that this is the mechanism and paradigm that we need to engage. The more tools we have at our disposal, the more accurate our theories are, the more accurate our theories are, the better that we can harness these theories to be able to affect viable outcomes. If we just move into the assessment range, for example, I'm not going to bore you with this slide, but these are the types of neurological assessment tools that are currently available in our toolbox. This is what we have in our toolkit that allows us either singular use or conjoined use of this registry of effect. And as you can see, they range from the fairly simple peripheral forms of thermo-optical imaging all the way to those things that are rather complicated, the co-registered use of more than one of these techniques together with genomic, genetic, and proteomic induction and assessments so as to be able to get a better picture of what potential predispositions may be in effect, dispositions are in effect, and substrates are mechanistically engaged as we move not only into the preconditioning phase itself, but then look to affect preconditioning through either these lower tech methods and approaches that we've described or by then targeting them specifically through some of the interventional approaches. However, please note that here too, even when utilizing assessment approaches, there are some issues that need to be conjoined. Clearly, there's a number of things that these can do. Many of the approaches we've just discussed here have characteristically been used mostly in the research setting, and that's notable. However, in moving towards a more translational viability, I think that there are a number of things that they can and often do allow, and I have these listed for you here. First and foremost, they allow a better understanding of the anatomical and physiologic bases, mechanisms, and in some cases, definable substrates of various forms of neurocognitive behavioral correlations. In other words, what's happening within neural systems and neural processes, node edge relationships that occur not only in the brain but also in the periphery that are involved in, subserve, and maybe mechanistically involved in many of the processes that we see in preconditioning, postconditioning, protection, optimization, and enhancement. But we're also able to determine in whom these things occur, in what patterns. And this is very important if we then look to marry preconditioning and postconditioning to a personalized and precision medicine agenda, which I think is indeed critical. It may very well be that although we all may possess these particular characteristics and abilities to some extent, the relative expression, like any other physiological set of characteristics, may vary based upon a host of factors, some genomic and genetic, others epigenetic, and others due to ongoing physiological interactions with our internal and ex external ecologies. And this is critical to be able to understand, and in many ways these forms of assessments can help to depict how these different effects may be manifest in individuals, communities, and groups. And of course, the goal here is quite simple. If we're going to move to take preconditioning and postconditioning into a relative translational mainstream, then it becomes important to at least be able to describe, if not define and predict, where the similarities lie between individuals and where the differences lie between individuals. And there are a number of ways to do that, not the least of which is by utilizing the schematic paradigm that I have demonstrated for you on the right-hand side of this slide that is amassing individual data, moving individual data to life and time span data, comparing that to various groups and cohorts, and then using that more populationally to get distributional curves. Now I know what you're thinking. Uh, wait a minute. This is an awful lot of data. Let's go back to the whole idea of new tools. We have something at our disposal right now, and certainly that is looming large on the agenda of reality, that I think potentiates and realizes much of this. And this is the idea of marrying various forms of biomedical data to a big data paradigm. Again, not without some contention, there are plenty of things that go along with that, not least of which are technical and ethical issues, and we can spare that for another time. However, I think one of the things you need to understand is that these types of things marry very well to a big data format because what they allow is the inclusion of data of a whole host, levels, types, extent of different approaches to data intake, utilization, and synthesis that can then be plotted across a variety of time scales, levels, and granularities. The big data approach is what will make neuroscience and technology work, 
and the big data approach to assessing preconditioning and postconditioning effects, I believe to be yet another one of the important tools that may be essential to shed light on what these older tricks are doing to provide them new formulation and new viability. Obviously, the goal here is to then take the information we have at hand, inclusive of the information we're building, and create new sets of validities, viabilities, and values. And this is where we move from the assessment range to the interventional range, literally utilizing some of the new tools we have in our grab bag to assess what's going on peripherally and in the brain so as to be able to then identify access targets and then perhaps develop means to access and affect those targets so as to potentiate and synergize what we're able to affect through preconditioning and postconditioning. In other words, how do we balance the scale, if you will, of utilizing these ecological techniques that many of you are dealing with, hypoxia, metabolic regulation through exercise, adaptive response, diet, etc., and then potentiate these effects on a variety of scales that range from the synaptic to the whole systemic. A number of ways can, in fact, be achieved and I think are viable for your consideration. These include, but are not limited to the ones I have here up on the board. So really the challenge and opportunity simultaneously is teaching the old dog new tricks. But in many ways, I don't view that as an old dog. I view that just as we have here. This is a puppy. Although the preconditioning, postconditioning field may be 30 years old, as Dr. Calabrese mentioned to you earlier, we've sort of crossed the horizon of new possibilities realized in some cases by the corpus of knowledge we have in the bank, but also an expanding vista of what may really be going on. If, in fact, we look at this as a developing puppy and not necessarily as an old dog, but one that has a little bit more of a longer developmental time span, I think the thing that really is going to help this puppy develop is that this little puppy can play with brand new toys. And the new toys are developmental aids. If we think of it that way, I think it makes a very, very nice analogy. Obviously, it's no it's no mystery to you that I'm a dog lover. And if you take a look at the way dogs play and learn like anything else, new toys added to the toolkit, new toys added to the toolbox can work wonderfully to be able to rejuvenate a somewhat bored or stale dog, a variety of the ages. And they learn new things. You can teach an older dog new tricks. And you can enthuse low tech with high tech. And you can potentiate high tech with low. Certainly, I think it's a paradigmatic shift. And I think it's one that we may be able to orient to quite well. And I think that it is one that's going to advance the field. These interventional neurotechnologies include, but once again are not limited to, various forms of pharmacological adjustment manipulation inclusive of ligand specificity based upon an increased understanding of the way hormetic doses may work on a nanoscalar range, and the actual employment of nanopharmacological agents, something that Dr. Calabrese and I have written upon for a number of years, in terms of what may actually be happening at the molecular level much of what you'll hear over today's lectures and tomorrow, particularly with regard to the way neurological systems function, recognize that nanoscalar effects that then engage downstream amplification are de rigueur within neural systems, as they are in so many other physiological systems. Increasing the specificity and thereby potentiating hormetic effects in those systems on the levels that range from the synaptic to the whole systemic may, in fact, be possible and, in fact, amplified by virtue of nanopharmacological induction. In other words, the more we can sharpshoot this system, the better we're able to do two things. Number one, illustrate that the hermetic effect is, in fact, occurring, or at very, very least, test its viability. Not necessarily prove it, but test it. And the second is in those tissues and in those systems where this testing has demonstrated its viable and valuable effect, then harness that to be able to engage particular outputs and performance maxims within the systems that we're looking to achieve. We may be able to also utilize a host of other technologies to affect these ends, inclusive, and not limit again to, forms of peripheral stimulation. And I mean very peripheral, and in some cases, absolutely peripheral nerve, motor nerve, sensory nerve, A beta nerve, C fiber nerve, just at their threshold, this is still somewhat contentious. But what is not so contentious is the evidence that we're building from things like vagal nerve stimulation that have demonstrated a whole host of peripheral to central effects, inclusive of monoaminergic modulation. And I'm not going to steal Gordon's thunder. He's going to talk to you all about that tomorrow, specifically with regard to the idea of spinal cord injury and how potentiation of monoaminergic systems through a peripheral to central and central intrinsic effect may indeed be very, very important to inducing both pre- and post-conditioning systems and pre- and post-conditioning effects that we're looking to achieve. Neurofeedback may also be viable in this, and what it tends to do is to actually create a trainable set of entities that are then viable within neural systems. And there's a host of information that would suggest that certainly neurofeedback may be useful when we're looking to engage preconditioning effects, particularly in those effects are neural and or cognitive in their, in their 
scan. Transcranial modulation, number of forms, most of these being transcranial electrical and transcranial magnetic, may also be viable. In the former case, transcranial electrical stimulation, there is a bit of contention that goes along with this, inclusive of the possible contention, a very provocative one, that indeed this may not be working at all and all we're seeing is artifacts. In other words, we're really seeing what we want to see. I disagree with that. I think that what's very, very important here is the contexts of the actual tests themselves and the nature of the performances and outputs that we're examining. And more and more, for example, some of the work of Marilyn Bixom, Vince Clark, Andy McKinley, Roy Hamilton have demonstrated that context matters. The context in which the brain state and or the neural state may be in may be critical to not only evoking the actual effects of transcranial electrical stimulation, but also to potentiating those effects to desired outcomes in various performance tasks. And this is one of the areas where I think it becomes very, very important to understand how a technique and technology like transcranial electrical stimulation may work very, very well in defined context in which other forms of preconditioning and postconditioning may be operative. We also see forms of transcranial stimulation that engage the magnetic pulse, and this is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, a bit less contentious and provocative than transcranial electrical stimulation because of the specificity of the pulse and the types and nature of circumstances in which it is delivered and then, of course, if we want to really take it to the extreme, we then move into the area of deep brain stimulation. And with deep brain stimulation, one of the things we're able to see is not only that you can stimulate certain neurological nodes and networks and thereby potentiate what appears to be a left or rightward shift in certain performance and, in some cases, protection curves, but we can also record from these systems and get a greater understanding of what the individual node-to-network interactions are and how these may be potentiated and, in some cases, advanced and optimized through standard preconditioning effects. We also recognize that much lower doses of current that were heretofore thought necessary induce an effect to what appear to be quasi-hormetic and or hormetic responses. This is a page that we need to turn as we go deeper and deeper down the proverbial rabbit hole of what deep brain stimulation is used for and can do. But I think before we go any further, I think it's important to cash one of these. And given the fact that this is right around tax time, I'm sure this really speaks nearly and dearly to all of your hearts, this is a reality check. And one of the things that comes up over and over again, we're talking about preconditioning, postconditioning, and certainly the work of some of these neurotechnologies and their effectiveness, is are we being realistic and are we being pragmatic in our assessment, our evaluation, and our prescriptions for use? And I'd like to think that indeed we are, but we are, if and only if in the philosophical sense, we conduct certain audits. First and foremost, an audit of what neurocognitive performance particularly means. I think protection is viable enough because we're working within a treatment range. Something's broken or something has the, cap the capability to break, and we're either repairing what is broken or preventing it from breaking. Well, I think protection is viable enough. And certainly that sort of exists in a nice little silo of well-defined capabilities and limits. But I think when we begin to move into things like optimization and performance enhancement, here bets are off somewhat because the borders get somewhat fuzzy. So I think it becomes important for us to define what we mean by that. I also think it becomes very important for us to define the actual neuroscience and technology and its capabilities, limitations, and what delimitations are real and on the horizon. And last and not least, let's not forget that there are ethical issues that go along with this. It's not just a question of what we can do. It's a question of what we should do. And then once we define, yes, we should do these things, are systems in place that allow them to occur? In other words, can we do what we know we should? Well, I think first and foremost, it becomes very important for us to define these terms. And I offer you these definitions, based upon the work of our group, to be able to provide what I consider to be relatively solid domains that are definitional. Protection entails prevention, mitigation, and maximize recovery. And I think anything that works under that rubric is definable with that level of granularity. Optimization and enhancement move a little bit more to the outfield. Optimization here is an enablement towards some type of standard range of function. If you think of the Gaussian distribution, I think what you're probably thinking of here is anything to the right of the mean. But when you get to enhancement, now you're really talking about augmentation. And here what we're talking about is those things that may be really, really right of the mean, and perhaps in some cases those things that may be novel and heretofore not necessarily seen. Are these things possible? Is this within our range of capability? The answer appears to be yes. It's simply a question of understanding what's going on and how we're able to do this. Here I offer you some much more detailed analyses of what these different terms may mean with regard to framing, protection, optimization, enhancement. 
I ask you to pay particular attention to the area of supplement modification because here is where the nomenclature, I think, becomes not only important but I believe critical. There's a lot of misconstrual in terms of what it is we may be looking to do when we're talking about neurocognitive and neurophysiological optimization and enablement and enhancement. I think what we're looking to do here is to supplement the normal physiological and output effects. And in fact, that this is reliably obtained without deleterious effects, we can call that an enhancement. That which is somewhat dramatic may be considered to be an extraordinary augmentation. And when we then define that within a particular range of a defined performance task, that can then be called a specialized enablement. Why do I give you these tools? Because I think what these tools will help you to do is to increase the specificity, the particularity, and the peculiarity of what it is you're doing. So as to be able to better define what the task is, how the tools can be used, and how you can then create some not only viability but value of the outcomes you may achieve. Modifications are also possible, as you'll hear over these next two days, and certainly as representative of some of the work that Ed and I have done over the past couple of years. And this really in entails engaging some non-standard capacity to an individual's performance range. In some cases, this may be a radical augmentation, and the idea of utilizing neurotechnologies together with some of these performance-capabilized methods may open this door. And I don't necessarily want to go too far down that rabbit hole because I think what it does is it tends to cause gremlins out of the proverbial box, if you will. But understanding the terms, framing the terms, and using them, I think, become important not only to the discourse, but also in realizing what this discourse can mean with regard to its opportunity and translation. I give you this performance calculus, and I think we can apply this to almost any area of preconditioning and postconditioning. A performance, A, B, C, and D, is some activity that is engaged by utilizing some form of bodily control, which may be modifiable through the techniques and technologies we're going to be discussing over the next two days, that enact some set of capacities, again, in this particular case, here the dependent variables of those things that each and all of you will discuss, within an environing domain, while coordinating with ensembles of others, particularly with regard to optimizing performance and enabling performance. So I think this becomes very, very viable to understand and what it then allows us to do is to define where performance capability and incapability lies and I give you an example of same. Engaging performance also engages what we consider to be STET variables which are training ensembles and tooling which then produce performance. Here too I think looking at a combination of some of the older tools with regard to what training may entail together with the ensembles of newer tools inclusive of these that I have just mentioned to you may be important to consider a broader paradigm and approach to then be able to deliver these valuable outcomes that each and all of you are looking to achieve. But in each and all of these, as I've said before, context matters. And defining these contexts is really important to specifying not only your research agenda, but its translational viability and value. And there are key questions that must be asked, and they're what we call the T questions. What is the task? In other words, what is the actual work to be done, whether it's protection, optimization, or enhancement? What are the techniques, neurocognitive processes that can be used or engaged? What neurological systems, substrates, nodes, and networks are engaged, we consider to be tracts. What training methods are necessary, and these trainings obviously include some of those techniques such as adaptive responses by dietary modification, metabolic modification, modulation, various forms of oxygen regulation, and controlled hypoxic and non-hypoxic states. And ultimately, what technologies do we have at hand to both assess what it is we're doing and how it works, and to perhaps potentiate and synergize the effects. In each and all of these cases, I throw out a challenge and opportunity to you, and I want you to remember these four letters, G-I-A-C, gap identification, analyses, and compensation. Realistically, what are the goods we're looking to achieve? What are the gaps in those goods? What do we know? What do we not? What can we do? What can we not do? Identifying where they are, analyzing the nature of what those gaps and goods are, and then compensating where the gaps lie so as to maximize the goods. Obviously, any one of these approaches is going to have a number of issues that we need to contend with, and these are what I would consider to be the problem sets that are inherent but need to be discussed in any approach to protection, optimization, enablement as we see with pre- and post-conditioning. Effects that occur when you alter a single system, an effect that this may in fact engage a network of systems, alterations of these network systems, and what may actually happen when you then alter and improve performances. And there are various hosts of things that can occur. When looking at the outputs that these systems generate, it may very well be that at first blush, we may see what appears to be contradictory effects. Yes, we know we've optimized performance of this particular system, but why do we not see an overall shift in the performance or protection curve? 
well, at our meta-analyses of the past 15 years of research, these are some of the contextual effects that we found. Yes, you can pump up the volume in A or B, but in so doing, you then may create interfering effects up or downstream, C, D, F, all the way to Z, and these also need to be taken into accord. Once again, I think that a mechanistic approach that helps us to understand how systems within systems interact become important for us to not only assess the nature of the effect, but also to assess in some cases why the effect is not as robust or perhaps may not be viable as we have predicted or as we would have anticipated. Certainly in this particular case, we also must anticipate that any form of neuroscience, neurotechnology, or any science and technology opens a Pandora's box of potential ethical, legal, and social issues. What are we really doing here? Are we asking people to be hypoxic? Are we telling them to hold their breath for so many minutes a day, to provide squeeze and pressure techniques to go days without food? Are we going to be utilizing these interventional assessment neurotechnologies in ways that impinge on individuals' capability and autonomy? These are some of the pushback questions we've actually received about this line of research and its translation. And this really brings forth the field of neuroethics, which as you may be aware, is studies of the ethical issues in and that are generated from brain science and its applications, inclusive of the way we may use brain science to understand cognition, emotions, and even ethics itself. But I want to be make sure we're, we're really aware of the fact that undergirding everything that is we're doing is a neuroethical, if not generalized ethical, obligation to do the research itself. The paradigm here is pretty simple. We can't know unless we go. So the strong pushing force is that we're orienting this research towards viable goods, protecting physiological systems and the organisms who have them, optimizing performance of those physiological systems and the organisms that have them, and in some cases, enhancing those performances in definable tasks. But it's not just a question of doing the research. It's also a question of doing the research in ways that is technically apt and ethical legally sound and to then look back on the research, not only the research we are doing now, but the research that has been conducted in the past, and say, where have we done well and where have we not? Where have we done rightly and goodly and where have we not? And then to correct those mistakes. And I like the diagram by M.C. Escher that I provided for you here because, in essence, this provides both a lens and a mirror to what it is we're doing, a lens into the science itself and a mirror onto how we're viewing the science and how we're leveraging the science within both the scientific and general community. Much of this research is opportunized by a paradigm shift in contemporary science, which is called Advanced Integrative Scientific Convergence, demonstrated to you as a shift from the leftward panel to the rightward panel. This creates an opportunity space to allow an exchange of information, not unlike the type of information exchange that we get here, but more broadly to be able to include collaborative and cooperative research agenda that are really, really geared towards translational foci. What this then does is it conjoins a whole host of different techniques in my field, neuroscience and technology, but also cyber science and technology, as we've talked about with big data, anthropological and social sciences. And this is then drawn into focus by trying to get some granularity onto what effects we're seeing in individuals and groups. And I ask you, each and all of you, to respond to that challenge, which you may be seeing in your laboratory bench at the bedside or in various populations. How viable is this? How translatable is this? What are you seeing in the individuals, particular cohorts, and is this, in fact, extrapolable to larger groups? And if not, why not? And that's part of the mission. And the actual mission here is balancing what we can do and what we ought to do. Because in many cases, what we can do with many of these techniques is exceedingly provocative and rather exciting. What we ought to do and if and how we can do so, well, that remains an issue. And this is really where I call to the fore what I would consider to be the preparatory ethical stance. Number one. I think what we need to be aware of is there are those who will stand and push back somewhat and say much of the effects that we're seeing here may be artifactual, may not be realistic, or may not be valuable in the context of use that many would consider. I disagree with that, and I strongly contend that, that is not the case, that the more finely granular and more specific and detailed we get in our analyses and our depictions, the more collaborative we are in our research, the more we assume this advanced integrative scientific convergent approach as sort of the zeitgeist of our way of going forward more able to demonstrate that these effects, number one, are real, are valid, and are mechanistically sound. The more granularity and specificity, the greater the peculiarity we're able to have with regard to understanding these mechanisms and substrates, the greater we're able to move from assessing to affecting. The greater the effect, the greater the outcomes, the greater the outcomes, the more applicability and obviously increasing value. So our approach is one that realistically seeks to engage the science, defining what it can do, what it can't do, what are the limitations, and seeking to delimit them. 
It defines these domains and dimensions of the techniques and technologies that are being employed. And it addresses also what should be done to advance these into the forefront. But once again, I want you to be aware that any move to taking these into translational foci should be ethically grounded. And we've actually developed a paradigm, if you will, a framework for doing this. I'll not bore you with the particularities. You can certainly get these slides available from Dr. Calabresi. And at the end of this presentation, I have the references in which they're taken. But I was asked to develop an actual ethical framework so as to be able to allow the rapid translation of cutting edge science, both high and low tech, into a translational format. It involves establishing six R's, responsibility for assessment, research regulation, responsiveness, and revision, that can then be sort of situated within asking key questions of what we're looking to do with the research and its translation. What types of techniques, why are these techniques being considered for use, who will receive them, when, where, and are there mechanisms in place for continuity of research and clinical care if and when things don't go necessarily the way we had planned. Obviously, these are then framed in what we call the six C contexts of the capacities and limitations that we have at hand and what we're planning the consequences of the research and the consequences as incurred on those individuals who are our test subjects and our patients, how the character of treatment may affect the character of the individuals who are treated individually in groups, the availability of continuity of clinical care and research, the nature of consent, what we need to inform our patients about given intellectual honesty and veracity, and actual contexts of use which may change. So for example, Dr. Kazumbo and I work quite frequently with a variety of DOD agendas and incentives, and those particular silos of use with regard to protection, optimization, and enhancement may be quite different than those that we see in the general population. These need to be taken into accord and weighed appropriately. What I'm asking for here is a responsive posture. As we move forward trying to engage this new toolkit, these new tricks to teach to these young puppies that seem to be somewhat older dogs, I think the responsive posture has both an acknowledgement stance and an obligatory stance. The acknowledgement is that much of what we're doing is pushing a cutting edge, not necessarily in high-tech S&T, but in utilizing high-tech science and technology to be able to elucidate what some of these older techniques may be that are lower tech in their nature, but are equally provocative and physiologically viable. This is the condition at the frontier. Many times people look to this area of preconditioning and postconditioning to say, this is a frontier of what we know and what we don't, and the conditions are always uncertain there. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go. A frank or simple precautionary principle doesn't work here, but a precautionary stance that then engages preparation does. I think realistic what we need to do are essentially three things. Number one, pragmatically assess the trajectories and effects of what we're looking to achieve and the mechanisms by which they're entailed. Number two, try to recognize, prevent, or in some cases not necessarily prevent, but at least mitigate the potential problems that arise, both scientifically and technically and socially and culturally with regard to what preconditioning is and how it may work. And then ultimately look back on the work we're doing ourselves, hold the mirror to our own work and recognize in some cases certain things work and certain things don't, and understand in whom, for what reasons and why, and so as be able to adapt our scientific and technological approaches. In this regard, I provide you the field that I work in neuroethics as a preparedness stance, and I want you to take particular attention to the three little images I have on the right-hand slide. I think the science and technology and its outcomes are very baitable. I think these provide sort of a moving target a viable bait that we're looking to achieve, something we're looking to take a bite out of. But in many ways, when described to various publics or user groups, it's equally attractive as a bait. Certainly, what that then does is that informs the ethical stances that we must take, the ethical stance to continue to do the research and do the research in the right ways, and also to utilize the outcomes of these ways that are right and good. And very often, ethical, legal, and social issues can make noise about that. But take a look at that shark. It's a basking shark. Ethics, social, legal issues very often are advocated with a big mouth but no teeth. It's moving from the scientific and ethical domain into the policy and regulatory domain that grows the choppers that are going to take a bite out of realizing the type of work that we're doing. My advocacy here is quite simple. I think the work that each and all of us are doing in our laboratories, at the bedside and beyond in this room and in the communities that we represent are important to be able to provide viable bait that informs the necessity of moving pre and post conditioning into a scientific and biomedical mainstream. I think there's an ethical obligation to do so and I'll champion that wholeheartedly and bang that drum. That is a big bait fish that yields huge, what I would call feeding yields, feeding resources, feeding goods. However, I think we also do need to make a bit of noise that we're doing this in ways that are ethically right and ethically good and we're advancing that ethical agenda. But to do so in those ways necessitates money, support, 
and laws that allow it to be translated and advanced. My goal is simple. Let's teach the old dog some new tricks and do it with the neuroscience and technology of assessment intervention we have at our capability. With this new knowledge and capability comes tremendous power, but with tremendous power also comes responsibility. I think we hold a future in our hands. My hope is that we don't drop it. Thanks very much for your time. If you want more information, there's some of my work on the field. And if you want to get in touch, that's where I live. Thank you. and by the same token try to maximize our foresight and with the same sense of accuracy. To do that, I think it's a question of harnessing these new tools in the appropriate ways. Mechanisms are important. You know, despite our pushback on this, I think we really do live by what we sometimes call the mechanistic dilemma. We don't believe that something works until we understand how it works, even if we only have a partial understanding. But I do think that one of the key research agendas is to dig more deeply into what these mechanisms are, as you'll hear over the next couple of days, and to then utilize an understanding of those mechanisms to perhaps identify viable targets, not only for continued assessment, in whom, for what reasons, under what circumstances, but also as targets for intervention, not only utilizing some of the adaptive techniques that each and all of you may be talking about, whether it's metabolic alterations or dietary restriction and exercise, maybe various hypoxic environments, et cetera, but also through the use of some of these newer technologies that may be able to then potentiate these effects and understanding what the spatiotemporal relationships and synergistic relationships are. So I think defining the research agenda and doing so in a way that is supportable and is supported becomes critical. Did I answer your question? Let's turn the back. Would you regard Facebook as a population preconditioning tool? Say again, please. Would you regard Facebook as a population preconditioning tool? Facebook? Yeah, I'm you? just so that, extrapolating you, to the social world. Wow, it's an interesting question. I mean, so, I mean I, it really depends on what you're talking about <clears throat> for preconditioning. I think there's a, a, a cognitive and social preconditioning effect that can occur, certainly, that an inculcative effect. I think if what you're looking to try to do is engage make aware and in some cases alter individuals and groups behaviors one way to do that would be through social media and certainly we see the new social media as a viable not only research tool but translational tool but i think with that regard it's also very important number one how you spin the narrative and number two the accuracy of the information that is then provided because you know as well as i do that all i have to do is turn on my computer and there's all a bunch of garbage on there so creating a viable online portal that number one is valid, number two, is viable, and number three, is valuable to potential user groups and stakeholders becomes critical in that regard. And that may be a challenge and opportunity that a group like this seeks to address. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's a big data question, and I'll, I'll pay you. It's my, you're my perfect straight man. I'll pay you later. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, looking at big data, particularly with regards to the use of neuroscience and technology, is something that our group has been very keenly aware of and very interested in over the past couple of years. And our group at Georgetown is very interested in this because we've actually developed a rather large big data engine or big data tool that is able to accumulate large bodies of data from their resident data sources without moving them, number one. In other words, there's no shift with regard to the proprietary use of the data. And many of these data can be de-anonymized with complete security. Let me say that again. They can be de-anonymized with complete security. It was actually a research tool that was developed in conjunction with the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. The name of the tool is called Aves Terra. 
If you're interested in more information about Avisterra, please feel free to contact me. My information is right up there on the board. What the Avisterra system provides is a big data analytic, viability, and user tool that's able to integrate different types, levels, and data in real time, massive data, incorporate those massive data and do one of two things with it. Number one, fit those data to definable patterns that are generated by a user group or utilize a host of intrinsic decision technologies to extrapolate and extract data into patterns from the databases that are being utilized. Again, security is primary based upon what the actual tool was developed to do. We primarily work in healthcare contexts. And the issue here is that it is, in fact, viable both as a standalone tool and as a collaborative and cooperative tool with other forms of databases and data banking. So I think one of the things you see is if you go back to the slide where I demonstrate it looks like a funnel, it becomes very, very important to be able to amass individual data that is gained across a host of time spans, what we like to consider as individual lifespan data, and then compare that to like groups, cohorts, larger populations, and in fact populations in general, perhaps on a global level, to be able to determine a more accurate depiction on a variety of levels of uh, particularity as to what things work and what individuals under what circumstances when. I think what this really allows us to do is to not necessarily get just a kaleidoscopic depiction of what's working, what isn't, but a much more microscopic picture and at the same time a telescopic picture. And it's that fine granularity and broad granularity that need to really be incorporated in any big data approach and do so in a secure and private way that therefore maintains both the protection of the data and the actual individuals to whom those data belong. And we're confident that in fact our system has been tested and demonstrated to do so. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I work in Washington, D.C. The whole idea is we can accomplish great things, we don't care who gets the credit. Um, you're absolutely right. What about the competition? It's a competitive field. I'm not saying it's the only big data tool out there, because certainly it is not, and it was developed in direct response to other tools that were available so as to be able to leverage capabilities. It is a highly competitive field and I think one of the things that needs to happen is that many of these data resources also need to be curated. That's been a big problem, for example, with some of the work we're seeing in the DARPA subnets and RAM program. We have different levels, different types, and large, large volumes of data that range from the synaptic all the way to the social that are coming from different user groups and have different stake and shareholder values, valuations, and viabilities. And these then need to be curated in such a way as to make this sensible so that data can then be remanded, replaced, etc. So there is the ongoing correction revision strata. The other issue is simply pulling patterns out of the data, which is an equally challenging task. So our tool, although I think is quite good and has been tested to be very, very effective in various applications, exists with a host of others. And I think that the actual challenge and opportunity is to work in a coordinated way so as to be able to accumulate big data, utilize big data, and employ it in those ways that are workable to different contexts. In this case, preconditioning and postconditioning being one of them. Walt. Uh, one last comment. That is, uh, when, I, when I hear you talk about big data, uh, I think of genomics and proteomics that are collecting massive amounts of information. And then in one slide, talk about how you're going to look at the population go from the individual to the population. And the population with massive data and analytics, you can get averages, you can get ranges, but your real problem and something that will be able to, I think, conjoin your work, which is the effect and the neural ethics, is knowing exactly what dose you can give to an individual. So, so being able to predict because if you can't, you know that the dose, doses that may be effective to one individual may be harmful to another because of the variability. Correct. So that underlies, no matter what technology you use, you're going to have to understand that. And in a sense, that's why you're here, because that's the issue we're talking about. And I think that's going to be really key, because you can't argue ethics and you can't yeah. argue that you're going to give the person the right dose. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, so, so Dr. Kazumba brings up a very good point that I somewhat glossed over for the sake of time. And that's the point that exists here on the left-hand part of the slide that really illustrates for you how we get from the individual to the group level of data. What becomes very important is to maintain the peculiarity of the individual. The, the way we engage these large-scale assessments is individual to individual comparison across time points and then individual to group data and then group to individual comparisons. These are both normative as well as comparative. 
But ultimately, if what we're going to do is, as I had mentioned, marry this to a precision medicine methodology approach and paradigm, and do this with particularity, so now we're getting literally personalized approaches, which is one of the, I think, enticements that big data offers, then maintaining that individual to group balance and doing so with the granularity that is important that I've tried to emphasize throughout the scope of my talk will be the marching order, and I agree with you. Thank you for your time.